for coming to our live video chat tonight. Uh, I'm John from the Wingman 115 channel. I have Andy Tran from Inner Bark Outdoors, and we have our special guest tonight, Johnny Barrett from Calibarrett.com, the inventor of the bio stove. Uh, we'll do some quick introductions, and then we will uh, get right into the topic at hand. Andy, can you tell us a little bit about your channel? Yeah, um, YouTube channel based out of Seattle, Washington. I've got a new channel this year, Interbark Outdoors, and it's a lot of survival, instructional, and uh, kind of lifestyle type stuff. I am the designer of the Tops to Home a Field Knife, which is on pre-order right now, which is a, a really cool kind of field survival -y type knife, and um, I think that's it for me. Oh, and I'm a cameraman for a living, and then when I'm not using my equipment for work, I'm pretty much just doing YouTube to keep them warm, so, yeah. Cool, Johnny, you want to introduce yourself? All right, what's up? My name's Johnny Barrett. I am uh, the inventor and creator of this bad boy right here. It's the uh, Caliber Bio Stove. Uh, been in the works for about six, seven months. It's basically a stove runs off of any biofuels, uh, wood, pine cones, cow dung, if you even have it. Um, burns really efficiently, and uh, that's what we're uh, going to be talking about a little bit tonight. Cool. Well, starting right out of the gate, why don't we talk a little bit about um, your philosophy and give us a little bit of backstory on how the bio stove came about. Awesome, yeah. So me, when I got, got around to the, how I how the whole thing came about was 2006, 2007, through my college at the time, they had this program where you could go volunteer overseas for a year, and they sent me to this incredibly small island in the South Pacific in Micronesia. The island was only about two miles long by a mile wide, uh, very limited resources, only had about five, 700 people on it, and it was there, there was no electricity, no running water, none of the, the things you're used to in America. And there I learned outdoor techniques, I mean, from true locals that knew what was up, uh, how they started fires, how they cooked, uh, how they prepared their food. Um, and then I noticed how much resources it took to cook their food, and especially on an island that small where, granted, there's lots of palm trees and things, but they're using so much of that material to prepare their food. So when I got back to the States, I got into outdoor activities, camping, hiking, um, and I wanted to see what was out there in the renewable resources fuel. And after looking around, I saw some things that I liked, uh, but nothing that I was sold on. Um, so I thought, I'm going to start messing around with this. Started making some prototypes, and uh, here we are. And I wanted to make sure it was 100% fabricated and made in America. Yeah, that uh, that was one thing that when you and I first started talking that uh, I mentioned in my video about how passionate you were about sourcing all the parts out here in the United States, making it 100% made in the USA, which is really, really rare and uncommon nowadays. Yeah, so I basically am a business major, and I just finished my master's in business, and, I mean, so many of my course studies were on outsourcing and, I mean, the impact it's having on America and, and then my own personal studies of how we're relying on other countries to do basically everything for us. And so I thought it would be a really cool project to see can you make something that is bulletproof, um, lasts forever with American-made products, and happily I can report I was able to do that. Good. Absolutely, and so that means like all the screws, all the hardware, even um, the metal where it's smelted, is that all in the U.S.? As far as I know, I mean, as far as the melt, the, all the metal for like the tubing, the lids, everything like that is, is American steel, correct? Awesome. Yeah. So it was hard to hunt down, especially for the, uh, the, uh, the hinges. A lot of these hinges you can get super cheap from China, but there's one company in the East Coast that makes them for yachts, and uh, I was able to order a few of those from them. 
Yeah, because I know, like here in Seattle, we have a lot of yacht makers, and we have a huge maritime thing. And the thing about Chinese metal is they don't put the time and quality into it, so you get, you know, little bits of slag and all these other impurities that make the metal brittle, and uh, it won't last you very long. So yeah, that's awesome. And especially for, I mean, since this is a stove, you're dealing with high heat. And anytime there's high heat and metals, you're going to have shrinking and expanding the metals. And a way to combat that is to use stainless steel. And within stainless steel, there's many grades of stainless steel. I mean, you can start in the 300 series, but until you get to about that 310 level, uh, anything else is kind of even going to warp a little bit with heat. So that's what I made all my uh, components out of. Awesome. So let me, let me ask you a question real quick. When you've done some tests on these, have you ever done temperature tests to see, like, what's the hottest flame that, that you've ever had coming out of this stove? Because when I cooked that bacon and I was stoking that stove with the pine, it was getting hot. Yeah. No, it, it gets really hot. I actually got a, um, not a super scientific uh, laser thermostat, but... I was I was burning, 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 and I was just uh, measuring this temperature right here, and this is with the insulation. And I was getting this bad boy up to like nine, nine fifty, and the flame I was measuring about thirteen, fourteen, and that was using really nice dry hardwoods, you know, that burn really cleanly and hot. Um, you're gonna have different temperature variants with different types of fuel, but for the most part, you can you can get a thousand degree flame if you want. And the awesome thing about this design is with these doors right here, you can actually use them as a damper door if you want to just simmer some coffee or if you want to just, you know, keep the coals warm but not go out. Awesome. That's cool that it gets that hot because I've been doing a lot of research into um, masonry heaters and that sort of thing and the temperature required to really gasify all the material and make sure that there's no uh, creosote and anything like that that will foul up your chimney. So that's yeah. pretty cool. And actually, it's not um, a family friend of mine. He's a senior in high school, and he's doing some advanced physics test, and he's actually doing a project on my uh, stove, and he's going to do scientific uh, uh, tests on different fuel types, uh, how long it takes to boil water. And so when I get that data, I'll post it and be actually pretty excited to see it myself. Sweet. Now, for folks that don't know, Johnny has also a Facebook page um, where you'll probably, in future posts, put some of that information as well as your website, right, at kellybarrett.com? Correct. Yeah, so be on the lookout for that because uh, as Johnny develops this and refines it, that information will most likely be funneled through social media, which is a great thing. Now, um, you, we were talking, and you had put powder coat on there. Can you talk about the difference that powder coat makes on the stove as opposed to just, say, a regular, just bare-bones steel stove? Uh, have you noticed a difference, like, in heat transfer and being able for the wood to burn maybe fuller? And we talked about the gasification of, you know, getting a good burn. Can we talk on that a little bit? Yeah, so there's basically a few categories with that. Um, first, if you have just bare metal, it's not going to be as insulated, and it's also going to have rust issues. So you can either do, like, kind of just a stove paint, which is, like, going to be a flat black, but it's not going to have any kind of ins extra insulation. So the only two things that can withstand high heat are going to be ceramic coating, and powder coating. Now I did a lot of research into it and ceramic coating is designed to put on headers, you know, things like that and it's actually designed to dissipate the heat, get that heat out of there. And that's why a lot of people, high temperature powder coating is kind of actually rare because it acts as an insulin and keeps that heat within it. So I had to do a lot of looking around and shopping around and especially in a place like Southern California that has tons of industry, especially for powder coating. I had to travel ways to find a guy that I liked his work, and he did high temperature powder coating. So when you have that high temperature powder coating on here, it's just going to help with, because I use a thicker wall material for the uh, pipe, it's just going to help with that insulation, and it's just going to get allow that uh, combustion chamber to really, really heat up, 
and get that second combustion of the gases within the wood. Yeah, and as I, you know, as I showed folks on uh, the video that I shot, that uh, it, it burned clean. I I was really impressed at how burned it clean. And we were talking earlier about, you know, if we're burning hardwood in there, that you were saying that it just burns even better. Yeah. Now, uh, Andy and I and you were talking offline. Can you describe some of the fuels that you burn in there and some of the different characteristics of the fuels that uh, you can burn in there and how clean of a burn with some of the fuels and maybe yeah. what might soot or smut up a pot uh, if they use a certain type of fuel? Absolutely. With any biofuel, I mean, hands down, if you want a clean, consistent flame, your best options can always be some kind of a gas-based fuel. But that's not this stove at all, and it's not trying to replace that. This is just uh, kind of a different category of stove. And so what you're going to do, if you're planning a camping trip or whatever, and you know you're going to be using this, the best thing to do is uh, take just any kind of wood, like even uh, fire burning wood, cut it up into smaller pieces, and you insert it through this magazine tube, and it rests on this stainless steel fuel rack. And that's going to give you, and if you, you just want like that comparison size pieces of wood, and that's going to give you your cleanest burn. But say you just have this in the back of your car, and unprepared, or something, a natural disaster happens, and this is all you have. You can use any materials from pine cones, pine needles, brush, um, anything, and you're just going to shove it. You can either shove it down the uh, chimney or through the magazine tube. And at first, it's going to be a lot dirtier of a burn, uh, but once you get that combustion chamber warmed up, it is going to burn more clean. But you're at, you're going to have to feed it more often just because of the fuel material, and you're going to have a slightly maybe more dirtier burn because there might it might be wet, it might have uh, other contaminants in it. And uh, if you're going to be doing some softwoods. Um, if there's no way around it, like my area, there's not much hardwood at all. Uh -huh. uh, the good thing is to get a little bit of like soap and put it on your pots so that, that uh, creosote is really easy to clean off. After. Absolutely, yeah, that's good advice. Well, I bet Andy up where you're at, I bet cedar would burn in there really nice. Oh, yeah, cedar burns like a maniac, and it's lightweight. Like, I can carry a good-sized trunk, and I'm not a very big guy, so uh, that stuff's awesome. But yeah. I mean, it doesn't it doesn't last very long. Is the only problem. I have a couple questions uh, over on the YouTube side. Uh, this is uh, by Loaded Fist. He has a question for Johnny. He says, "If you rig a chimney for the stove, can you use it to heat a tent?" Yeah, and that's something I'm kind of in the works on. Um, I am prototyping with a larger uh, platform of a stove with a chimney. Um, but yeah, I mean, th this does radiate, and a buddy of mine actually used it on an off-road trip he was in the local mountains, and it was getting down to like the teens degree, which I mean, for California is like, you're going to die. Uh, but they, what they were doing, they were burning this as hot as they could, and they were just filling the chimney with as much wood as they could to get pretty high flame, and they put it up against a rock, and they were bouncing that radiated heat back to them. But as far as a tent... If you put this a chimney through the tent, absolutely, it's going to put out heat. It's not going to put out as much heat to fill like a large tent as a, like a large um, stove would. But if you have a smaller on the smaller side tent, this guy would even work out. And I am working on an adaptation, uh, an adaptive uh, chimney solution. Not yet, though. I was going to ask about too, because it seems like it's so simplistic and it's so compact. There's a lot of uh... Uh, opportunities for expansion and modification on this thing. Yeah, and one of the one of the other things is I built this so simple and so uh, straightforward that if a dude wants to mess around with it, awesome, more power to you. That's why I even I used a, a slightly thinner wire for the feet in case it gets knocked around or banged out. You can use a mallet, kind of form it to what you want. Um, everything's I used uh, just normal. 
uh, Phillip head screws on everything, so if you need to service it or take it off, go for it. Um, and, uh, yeah. Yeah, I have a question from Scouting Free. Uh, it's Mark over in Germany. And he says, do you ship stoves to Europe? And he's asking what would be the pricing. Okay, I have gotten a few inquiries on overseas shipping in Australia. I haven't looked at Europe pricing. It's going to be pricey of what I've seen so far. Um, I would love to enter those markets. Um, Australia was around 80 bucks, which is ridiculously expensive, I understand. Uh, I can look into Germany. He can, If he wants to, you can just shoot me a personal email, uh, johnny at calibrate.com, and we can go from there. Uh, if if you know of, if you can get some group buys put together, uh, I can get shipping lower, and I can probably give you a discount on ten or so stoves. That's yeah. wonderful. Yeah, because I, I mean, me selling knives and stuff like that, um, people tend to do group buys because the shipping is ridiculous. Because you got the customs, you got the taxes, and then just the regular, you know, UPS or USPS charges that they have, and oftentimes the shipping darn near costs as much as the item they're buying. Yeah, I, I was really disappointed with it, how much it was going to cost to ship overseas, and uh, I, I think that deters a lot of businesses from entering things like, especially when you're lower volume. Yeah, well, hopefully later on you might be able to get a distributor or something like that internationally, which will uh, help you out a lot. Hey, I got a question from Junior Survivalist, and he wants to know what the advantages does the Cali. Calibre bio stove have over a gas stove? Basically your fuel. I mean, gas stove, you have the potential of running out of gas. Uh, this is something that any condition, any fuel source, you will be able to boil water or you will be able to cook your food. You will be able to stay somewhat warm. Um, let's see, what was I going to say? Um... So what I do, I keep one of these in my car at all time, and I keep waterproof matches, and I keep uh, fuel in here. So although you can keep all that stuff for a gas stove, like for a little jet boil or a pocket, uh, rocket, pocket rocket, this is something I don't have to worry about. I can just throw it in the back of my truck, and it's always there, and I know it's always going to work. And when I do use the fuel that's in it, I know I'm going to be able to find fuel. And it's also tons of fun playing with these. We go up to the mountains, use these, and it's just fun to keep keep the fire going, you know, have a buddy and cook some food. And yeah, I'll the, also say that when the temperature gets down, stoves like this, and I'll, this is like my pretty much three-season, one-person stove, but at about 20 degrees Fahrenheit, this thing starts to just barely put out a flame, and then you're really in trouble. Then you have to switch to liquid, and they have to carry a bunch of canisters and all this stuff. Um, so that's a huge thing, too. Like, the uh, versatility of the actual fuel is a huge thing because this definitely has limitations. Absolutely. Good point. Thank you. You're right about that because, uh, you know, there's times that I've been camping and I brought white gas from my Coleman stove, and the containers opened up inside my backpack, and guess what? All my clothes and my food smell and taste like white gas for the whole trip. And that's poison right there. Oh, big time. And with my jet boil, which I'm a big fan of my jet boil, because I take that to concerts, uh, you know, we're out in the parking lot making cocoa and stuff. But you're right, at elevation, it, and when it gets too cold, that isobutane, you're losing BTUs out of that thing. Wood, it's going to burn no matter what. <laughs> it's at any elevation, so. Yep. Yeah, and it was, uh, the first time I experienced it, it was like 15 degrees outside, and I was trying to just get enough uh, boiled water to make some tea or something like that. And uh, the friend that was with me was like, is that canister empty? And we're like, no, this thing's like, you know, two trips old. It's just still full of it. But it was just barely going out, and then, uh, you know, we got the water boiled after like a half hour of waiting and like shielding it from the wind and everything. Um, cooled it down, shook it, and it was still like all the way full pretty much, so... Um, even with a full canister, these things suck when it comes to cold weather. Hey, Johnny, just a crazy curveball question. Can you burn, like, say, a few charcoal briquettes in there, like I do Dutch oven cooking? 
could you put a couple couple briquettes on the uh, on that slider grill in there, and then maybe I might try doing the Dutch oven thing with that. Do it. Definitely try it. And I've done. I'm messing around with it a little bit. What I did, I took I took actually the fuel grate out for that, and I just placed them in the back of the combustion chamber here. And I really, I, I only had this, I used the, this as a damper door, and I had it only open about that much just to let a little bit of air in there, and it was uh, putting out quite a bit of heat on top, and it's an awesome way too. So that's kind of cool. If you're slow cooking with the Dutch oven, you can, you could in essence control your heat output just by opening and closing the door. Yeah. So just playing around with it a little bit, you could probably get pretty good at temperature control with this thing. Yeah, and not to uh, and not to um, uh, suggest uh, breaking any laws or anything, but a buddy of mine this last weekend took this camping, and he was in a, a place he wasn't 100% sure if he was allowed to be cooking uh, fire. And actually, I think these are allowed in the local San Bernardino Mountains because it's a contained fire. And um, he what he did, he thought he saw someone coming, so... He had it. He was burning his wood, and in a pinch, you can just close up the doors, front and top, throw it in. It'll immediately put out your fire. I mean, that's awesome for safety, and it also contains all these hot coals, so you can just let it cool down, and there's no risk of a. Or it takes the risk way, way, way low for starting any kind of fires. Hey, we have some good questions uh, on on the uh, forum tonight. It says. Uh, Living Survival is asking, how much does it weigh, and what are the advantage over a uh, ember? It must be an esbit stove or a firebox, which you can pack down to almost nothing. Well, the ember lit is like a small um, stove that has like four sides, and I'm pretty sure you just kind of put it together into like a box type thing. Yeah. Yeah. So this stove right here, this model is going to weigh about nine and a half pounds dry, which is a lot of weight. And serious backpackers, that's not, that's not the market. This is for car campers, hunters, or if you're with a group of dude and you want to hike this in, that might be feasible. Um, but the advantages of any other stove that is going to burn off any kind of biofuels or any kind of any other uh, materials besides gas is this thing, and this goes back to my core value, this is 100% bulletproof. I mean, you can drop this off the table. Nothing's going to break. You can roughhouse it. Nothing's gonna be damaged. I mean, I did every detail was focused on to make this 100% reliable. And going even down to the welds, this is hand tick welded, and all these holes are CNC drilled and then tapped with a tapmatic. And uh, that, to me, that's the big advantage. That under any circumstance, nothing's gonna get squished. Not no. Uh, no uh, clay is going to crack. It's just always going to work. Yeah, I, I can s speak to how that, that bad boy is built tough. You know, and we were t I was talking about that in my video. If, you, if you're doing a base camp, I had one guy that I was talking to that's an ice fisherman, and, and when I mentioned it in the video, he was like, yeah, I never thought about that, you know, going out ice fishing, and that would be cool. There's just so many different considerations that you can use the stove for. I have a gentleman on the uh, face, uh, not Facebook side, YouTube side, asking uh, Johnny, "What's the advantage of when you wrap the stove?" Because so, saw a photo where the stove was wrapped. Yeah, absolutely. So I have an option where you, I I take this uh, exhaust. It's basically the same stuff they wrap motorcycle headers or exhaust headers with, um, and that that goes from. Oh, I actually I have one in the garage. I should have brought it out. It goes from right here to about right here, and I just wrap this combustion chamber. And what that's going to do is just even more insulation. So say you are say you really, really are focused on getting the most efficient burn you can, although this is incredibly efficient already. It's just going to insulate that so you get that second combustion of gases within wood or pine cones or whatever. You're going to have that double combustion, and this it's just going to get an extra hot flame. That's the main advantage. Yeah, I saw that stuff, and I, and I immediately brought me back to, you know, when I was uh, working on my muscle car and my motorcycles and stuff, because uh, it reduces the resistance 
between the uh, air molecules because it's it rem remains hotter, so it exits faster. Um, but for this, it's awesome because it's, it you don't need, I guess, huge masses of brick or anything like that to make sure that that gets super hot. Correct. You know, one of the guys mentioned on here, and this is why I love doing these chats because it just makes you think about so many different things. Goes, you can see the stove being loaded up with emergency supplies when not in use and stored in your truck or car. Absolutely, and that's I use it for that. I have a little bit of thing of uh, food in there, a lot of fuel, and uh, I keep a little pocket knife and a, a multi-tool in there. Just at all times, and I mean, it, it's it's. I mean, it makes it a little heavier, but at it at all times, I know if I need to grab this and just go, at least know I have that. I use it almost as a little cachet in my truck. Hey, we What's have. A, what fire starter do you use for it usually? I um, I'm a big fan of the Zippo, um, but if you want to do, uh, I actually just. Take wood, make shavings, put it into like a bundle, light that, and then put smaller pieces down the chimney and light it. Actually, similar to how Wingman did in this video. Okay, cool. Uh, let's see, Mark again from Scouting Free from Germany, and we we have a couple international viewers tonight. Uh, awesome. Gentleman from Ireland checking cool. in, and uh, Mark over in Germany. His question is, if you've if you feed, if you just feed the chimney, can you use the part of the grill like an oven? And if any one of us has tried it, I've messed around with that a little bit. And you're gonna, so I mean, with physics and gravity, I mean physics, heat's gonna rise. So you are gonna, this is gonna get hot in here. And I have tried like putting, I put in when we were camping this last time, I put a muffin in right in this. Uh, I put a muffin in right here, and I kind of just closed the door a little bit. And I was just having the fuel here, and it actually toasted it, which was pretty cool. Um, you can do it. It's, I mean, it's not. In all honesty, the primary use is going to be having the flame come out of here to cook. But I mean, oh, I'm hitting buttons because I mistakenly. Uh, <laughs> She's on mute. <laughs> We're live here, folks. I'm sorry. God damn it, Bobby. <laughs> I can't figure out how to shut him, get him going again. <laughs> oh, it's a live show, folks. I'm sorry. Yeah, I'm only sorry. you can undo that. Click I on know. that little you... arrow thingy on the top, uh, top right of his icon, and then uh, you should be able to unmute him. No, I cannot. It won't unmute him. Oh yeah. shit! I mean, oopsies. <laughs> Let me see. Johnny, stick with us. I muted you by mistake. Am I there now? Yeah, you're there now. Yes. All right, cool. So to quickly answer the question, yeah, I'm actually working on a larger prototype model um, that would, if if you want more of a an oven esque characteristics, uh, stay around. Might have some uh, square tubing potential prototypes to look forward to. You know what would be really cool is if you put um, like a little tiny. Uh, tube on the side that's pointed vertically so that you might be able to put a little tiny like L-shaped uh, rod in there so that you can like dry off socks or something like that. I think yeah. that's pretty darn sick. Yeah. Yeah. I've been messing around. Don't want to don't let out too much but for the uh, model, the prototype I'm talking about, there might uh, be something to uh, keep your coffee mug warm maybe. Ooh. Alright. Say no more. <laughs> <laughs> No, that's uh, that's pretty cool. Let's see if we have any other questions in here. Uh, a gentleman was kind of getting it confused with the BioLight stove, and that, that's a big difference. That's the one that what has the USB charger. Yes, yeah, that, to it. That's a. Uh, it's basically a computer slash stove, and uh, the the downside is you can't get those wet because then it, the functionality of the stove goes down. Yes, yeah, so I actually when that when that came out, I actually got really excited about it, thinking like, "Oh, this is going to be awesome!" And I actually had the chance to play with one, and there's 
two, maybe three reasons that I really was turned away. One, it has moving components to get, because theirs is a gasifier, so they have a fan inducting air to make their heat. And that's an, it's an awesome uh, concept, but the components they're using, again, you're going to have heat, residual heat coming out. All those parts are going to get warmed up, and now you're relying on a fan to use your product. The other thing they're using is a, what, what is it, a thermo generator to charge your USB. Awesome concept, but now you're working, again, you're using things that has to go through an electronic board, and as Interbark said, potentially can fail, especially with weather. Yeah, and it's also kind of delicate too. And I saw when even when you pack it up, it looks like it's the size of like a two liter bottle almost. Uh, those things are pretty big. Yeah, no, and I mean not to bash them, they look they look awesome, and the concept's really cool. It's that's that's just not what my that's not the market I'm going for. I mean, again, if I don't know how many times you can use that and and it still works. Again, I mean, if you're if you're rough with it, if it's in the back of your truck and something bangs against it, how I felt it, it looks like it could, you know, have damage to it. I'm coming from the aspect of throw it in the back of your truck, nothing's gonna happen. Hey, That's Johnny, the American way. Johnny, take a yeah. second. There's there's a couple questions on here that folks are confused. I don't know if folks had seen my video or not on how you set a frying pan on top, but. Uh, they're they're wondering how you set a frying pan or a pot that's larger than the opening on there. Absolutely. So these on the top here, that's a laser cut lid, and these are J hook latches. You pop them open, and now the lid can come over. And stored inside are these removable, reversible heat exchangers. And you take them out. They look like this. They're kind of like question mark sevens. These are all laser cut. They're five sixteenths, and you get three of them in a stove. And you can see inside when it's empty, they just slide in to that welding tube. So now that it's out, you take it in the reverse position, and you place them in like so. And now you have a surface where you can, let's see how the light grabs it. You can put a pot. So it would sit like the, your pot would sit here and it allows a, a good amount of distance between the flame and the, the pot to really allow a little bit of, uh, if you have a larger like 10 inch pot, it allows that flame to kind of come out and heat the whole surface of the pot. One thing that I like that you decided to do is use three um, kind of supports instead of four so that if your pot is uneven because of heat warping or damage to it, it won't tip or wobble. Uh, yeah. I think that's a really good thing. Yeah, and, and then, I, again, I don't. Uh, if, if in an emergency this is all you have, you can, what, the double design of the fuel rack is you can use it kind of as a skillet. I don't know if that's picking up, but you just place it on top, and it gives you something to place... I don't know, some meat or food. Probably couldn't boil an egg, but <laughs> in a pinch it works. Cool. I want to see Andy cooking some salmon on a cedar plank on that. <laughs> I mean, that'd be pretty cool. I think, uh, yeah, that video that I did is pretty popular. And, you know, watching it over again, it's making me really hungry because I actually did that video. I think it was back in late summer, early fall. So I'm getting hungry again for it. Um, yeah, I might try and do something like that. I want to yeah. try it with the Dutch oven because I think a Dutch oven and this thing, you pretty much have something unstoppable because you can, you know, use the lid as a skillet or you can, you know, use the actual whole thing to do whatever. <laughs> Possibilities are endless. You just have to regulate the heat real well because if you get too hot, you're going to burn whatever's on the bottom of the Dutch. Right. Or I could see using a Dutch oven. I've baked cakes in a Dutch oven before, and you raise your pan up above the Dutch and close it in. I could, I might have to do a video like that now that I'm thinking about. It. I'm getting ideas here on how to cook. Yeah, I just put like three little rocks on the bottom and just separate yeah. and get a little, a little bit of airspace. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. and that's what's fun. You, it has. There's a lot of. It's not just limited to one thing. 
a lot of possibilities, and that's what's fun about it. Yeah, try doing that with, like, a regular camp stove. I mean, I love this because, you know, this weighs less than a pound, and uh, it's enough for just me and my dog. But uh, something like that would be sweet for base camp. Hey, Johnny, speaking of that, we have Carl Walker on the uh, comment side. He's asking, do you have any plans on making anything that might fit into an everyday carry kit that can be carried, say, a little bit easier? Um, for a legit EDC kit, probably not. I mean, to get something that you'd carry on yourself every day, I mean, you're, you're loyal. Um, because these things, I mean, they're not light, but I am working on a smaller stove that's going to be in about the four to five pound mark, so almost cutting it in half. Um, it's going to be made out of a three and a half inch, or I mean, excuse me, three inch tubing, um, and it's going to sit a little bit lower to the ground and be a little, even a little more simpler than what this is. Um, that is something you could potentially carry around in a backpack much easier, though. Any, uh, any chance that we might see, like, a titanium version or anything? I mean, honestly, even for myself, I've wanted to make one just to see how light I can get this sucker. But, man, is titanium expensive, especially if you're doing small runs. You're going to be paying, I mean, so much money. And I've looked into it a little bit, to be honest. I haven't, like, really, really researched it. Um, but that would be something to consider. That would be awesome, especially for legit backpackers. Yeah. And if people don't know, like, when they mine titanium, it doesn't come out as pure titanium. You have to separate it from oxygen. Same thing as aluminum, but a lot harder to find, so the price is huge on it. And that's another, I mean, you brought up a good point. Uh, someone asked me why I did Why did I not make this out of aluminum, and I'm actually personally against making things with heat, again, not aluminum, because, uh, I mean, you can actually, when you get aluminum hot, you can release certain chemicals within it, and that's why it's stuck with just steel. Yeah, yeah, because aluminum, uh, as an element, it wants to bind with oxygen, so oxidization and burning is really easy. Like, you can take a, a blowtorch and just graze an aluminum can, and that thing will disintegrate. So I wouldn't want, especially with the temperatures you're getting at. Yeah. Hey, we got confirmation from uh, Daryl Brads in Ireland. says that he has the BioLite. He's had it for a month. And where he lives in Ireland, he ruined it in the rain. See, hmm. and we'd be in the same boat because we got the same amount of rain pretty much. Yeah. I'd be curious to ask him how much, I mean, because I know in the States, uh, that's about a hundred and, I think it's about $130. I wonder how much, uh, if it's the same or if you had to pay a premium on that for Ireland. Daryl, leave in the comments how much you paid for it if you don't mind. <laughs> Along with well, your I mean, it's good information. It's good information that, Good information to know. They probably yeah. get hit with a value-added tax, I'm sure. On and, I mean, reports. just to quickly touch on the price, I mean, my MSRP is 139 and a lot of people are like, whoa, that's out of this ballpark. But, I mean, uh, the guy who owns the machine shop that I worked on, he thought I was ridiculous for marketing at that price just because he saw how labor-intensive. I mean, to have a guy on each one sit down and TIG weld, you know, and all the jigs, everything that came up, all the all the steel that is involved in this, it's it's a value. I mean, 139. I, w I wanted to get something out that someone could afford, and 139 was my about as low as I can would go, and I would even make a small profit. And to me, it doesn't sound that bad because I'm looking at some of the ammo can stoves that people are manufacturing, and those are, you know, 150 ish and up. So, so to me that's not outrageous at all. And where, where my mark was, how I my mindset entering this, if you Google rocket stoves, um, there's a few companies, actually I think up in Portland where you're at, there's a few companies that make rocket stoves. They're all overseas produced and they're all, the ducking they use to get their uh, combustion chamber is like air ducking, super thin material. Uh, the components are just not there for what, I mean, what I would want. And, I mean, they're at the 119, 120, 130 range. So I wanted to just be almost there and see if I could do it, and fortunately I was able to. Well, you know, I, we were talking about this earlier uh, offline. You know, I went to REI. I'm, I'm a REI geek, and I go there <laughs> and I look around, and I'm always trying to check out, like, the new, latest, greatest stuff. And if you're going to buy a jet boil, 
you're looking the cheapest jet boil, probably eighty nine bucks. Their top end one is over a hundred bucks, and yeah, it's appealing to like maybe an ultralight backpacker or whatever. But when you look at the stoves in the price range, I mean, you're you're in that ballpark. And the thing that sells me, you know, we Andy and I were talking about this on a couple other chats. You know, everybody's talking about, man, I wish stuff was still made in America. We're going to Walmart. We're buying all this stuff. Well, now you have an opportunity. Here's a gentleman right here, here in SoCal, sources everything 100% in America, putting people to work here at home. Me personally, I don't mind spending an extra 10, 20 bucks to know that I'm helping to provide somebody's livelihood here at home, and that money isn't going overseas to somebody else. Yeah. So, and, also, and, and on top of that, we have a lot stricter um, environmental laws. So you also have that like kind of um, assurance that uh, the scrap and all the chemicals aren't being put into a river where people are drinking out of, let alone all the other animals that are around, if there are any left. So to me, that makes it feel really good. And you guys are out of California, which is like on steroids, environmental laws and stuff like that. Um, so to me, that's that's a plus. Yeah, I mean that's another market I, I'm interested in. I mean, I market to is in the environmentalist. I mean, the fact that you can take renewable sources of fuel and cook, it's pretty awesome. I mean, you don't. I mean, and I'm a fan of natural gas, which is abundant in America and cheap and pretty good for the environment. But this is something. I mean, if you want to go on a camping trip, you don't need anything. You can just use what falls out of the trees naturally. Yeah, you could walk. You could walk around your campsite, and just the twigs and sticks that litter a campsite. Spending ten minutes, you could have enough right there to cook your meal. I proved I I only burned. I chopped a piece of that Jeffrey pine. It was about this big around and about six inches long, and I just batoned uh, a piece of that, and I used half of that piece to cook that pound of bacon. I mean, that was pretty efficient. So you wouldn't have to go get a lot of sticks, a lot of twigs to be able to cook a basic breakfast or a basic meal or to heat your coffee. It wouldn't take that much at all. Yeah, they're real efficient. And um, just to, before I forget, a, a shout out. If, if anyone's in the uh, San Diego or Southern California area, I'm going to actually be March 8 to 9. I'm going to be at the Del Mar gun show as a vendor. So, I mean, if you're curious and you like it and you want to come check it out, talk shop, and just see the quality of it, come down, check it out. I'm going to try I'm going to try to get that Saturday off and uh, hopefully Johnny will let me spend some time with him in his booth and uh, maybe we can do a meet and greet and talk about stoves and have a good time. So, uh, if I can get that time off, I'll definitely shoot a video and do a shout out and then we can hook up maybe on that Saturday. And uh, if viewers are living in SoCal or happen to be in the area, stop on in and say hi. So what, what does a gun show in California look like? Is it just like a like a Civil War reenactment type deal or what? <laughs> so imagine a gun show with no guns. Not okay, <laughs> got it. <laughs> They're actually not bad. Uh, I've been to a few. They're pretty cool, actually, because it's all that uh, cross... Crossroads of the West that they travel the whole West Coast area and Midwest a little bit. So it's pretty decent. Right on. It's a, it's a pretty big show down here at the Del Mar, where they have the Del Mar Fair, the Del Mar Race Track. Uh, the last time I went, probably about six months ago, I mean, there was a line probably about a quarter mile down the road of people waiting to get in there. So there's definitely folks here in SoCal that you know, want to, want to go check stuff out. See if well, they can uh, Loaded Fist is, says a comment, says, that's a great price. He says, I don't, he doesn't make a lot of money, but he can tell you, he goes, I spent way more than $130 on just a knife. He goes, not bad for a hundred percent American made product. Yeah. Appreciate that. Thank you. Um, Andy, do you have any Questions or comments? Well, I'd like to add on that, and it's like, you know, that's not a big price to me because I put 
basically all my money where my time is, and if I spend a lot of time camping and doing outdoor stuff, then that's not a big deal at all. Um, people all the time spend well over $100 on a cell phone plan, and they do that every single month and don't, you know, look the other way, really, to do it. Um, so to me, it's pretty much a steal, and especially because it's so simplistic, and if something should happen to it, any person worth their weight in salt could fix it. Um, so I think that's pretty awesome versus anything that we're used to, you know, you have to, like, get an actual teardown kit and a rebuild kit and then do all the stuff and, you know, shake it to clean it. And um, So this is pretty cool because it's very uh, primitive and modern at the same time. Well, I, now in a time of Xbox and all the smartphones, it's nice just to keep things simple. And it's it's so simple that it's just genius. That's what I love about the stove, that it just works really great. Uh, I look forward to – I'm going to try it with the Dutch oven and see if I can bake cornbread or something in there. I mean, that would be pretty cool. Try a pizza. That. Pizza works awesome in a Dutch oven. I do, that with the, I do that with the scouts all the time. We make pizza in the Dutch oven. It works pretty good. I know. Hey, Daryl Bratz in Ireland says, uh, and now I don't know what the conversion rate is here. He says he paid 80 pounds for it. 80 pounds. Let me, uh, I got a conversion thingy. Let me look up that real quick. Says it wasn't new. It's about the it same was, It was U.S. shipped to, to the uh, U.K. and then Ireland. It's about 130-ish. So that, yeah, that's not bad. That's pretty good. So if folks have any... Um, questions if you if you're watching this video at a later date <clears throat> you can get a hold of Johnny at um, calibarit.com right Johnny correct c a l i b a r r e t t dot com and or you can also, also me, uh, has a Facebook email. page do you have a Twitter account under that or I tw yeah I do have one I haven't been posting on it but I do have a Twitter Handle. I'm not sure exactly what it. I think it's just Calibert LLC. And he has a and a Google Plus page also. So there's multiple ways to get a hold of him. And uh, your email address, real quick. You can contact me directly at Johnny J O H N N Y at Calibert.com or contact at Calibert.com. And I'll I can take this opportunity right now to quickly uh, say that uh, because where I got my inspiration and I've made a few return trips to uh, the island I was on in Micronesia. Uh, I'm actually working with a, a nonprofit out there and for every 20 stoves I sell I'm trying to donate one myself um, just out of because they could use that and it would be super efficient. So um, yeah hopefully by summer and if, if that happens uh, or when it happens I'll take lots of video and videos and we can put up something up and talk about it. That's awesome, especially because it's like one to a family, and the population's not, you know, huge. So that that would make a huge difference. Yeah, and I mean, they're they're just it's super cool. That's what's awesome about going out and seeing the world, different cultures, different people's experiences, and how people are. Because people are cool all over the world, and I mean, to have opportunities like that are awesome. And that's what's I like about this stove. It's a good conversation starter when I'm out camping. You know, you meet people. Can talk about it, hear their life stories, see where they're coming from, and uh, just it's been a it's been an awesome experience putting this stove together. The whole process it's been over my head at times. I mean, uh, in business school they keep telling you that starting a business is hard, being an entrepreneur is so hard, and you're like, yeah, I believe it's hard, but it's it's truly difficult, and but it's well worth the reward just for getting a product that you made out there. And I'm sure you you know that Andy with your knife. Yeah, I mean, you probably have the same thing, but every time I see, like, a shipment go out, it's, I don't, I mean, I'm, I'm sure some people would think, I think about, like, oh, that's a, such and such amount of dollars, but to me, I'm thinking, like, how many trips that's going to go on, how many trees that's going to chop down, um, is it going to save someone's life, is it potentially going to take someone's life if it's going to be uh, used in a military operation. So it's uh, a lot of cool emotions all at the same time when you see your own product being used by people. And that's why I really enjoy it when people take pictures of the knife out in the field and uh, when people are using it. So it's pretty cool. 
Yeah, you express that exactly how I feel as well. That's awesome. Yeah. And it's nice to see two young guys developing stuff and doing productive stuff in a time where most guys are worried about buying a three-liter Shasta Cola and playing Xbox all day. So it's really cool that, one, you're doing things that is empowering people to have a, a better standard of living with your stove and Andy with his knife, both folks being able to go out and live adventures, to go out and get those life experiences. And that's a great thing. That That's the great thing about the United States right here. These two guys that are making things happen as we speak. It's just fun to be part of this. And, well, uh, I'll tell you what, though. You know, if you ever see a turtle on the top of a fence post, he didn't get there by himself. I had a lot of people help me out. Uh, all the guys at Tops and Eyes, all the subscribers that support what I do. So um, it's, a, it's not a single man operation, that's for sure. Absolutely, I concur. I mean, a lot of people give support, and I mean, that's what's awesome about family, friends, community, and especially people that you meet in your network of business associates. I mean, it's a lot of work putting something together, and no, no one man does it on its own. So absolutely, and I mean... For all the people that watch and helping me, that help me with my stove, shout out, thank you. Couldn't have been here without you guys. So, hey, I have a comment on here uh, from Junior Survivalist. He says, "I can see it now: the Cali Barrett and the Tahoma Field Knife, the ultimate survival combo." That'll be pretty much unstoppable. <laughs> all, you, all you need is like a bucket of nails, and you can build society. Pretty much. <laughs> we we need like. Uh, Stallone to do that commercial, or Chuck Norris, you know, to ner to do the voiceover for that commercial would be cool. <laughs> yeah. Whoever's doing the voiceover for all the movies that are coming out that has a really cool voice, that would be nice. <laughs> or Morgan Freeman. If Morgan Freeman can do it, I I'll, I'll sell for him. Uh, I think I asked one of the comments already about if you could bake stuff on the grill inside the stove. Yeah, um, I warmed up. I toasted a muffin basically with it. In that method of baking, I mean, it's gonna be. There's no temperature gauge. You don't know exactly. It would be all off of fuel. Uh, I mean, it's it's possible. I mean, uh, what what what's so cool about baking is all uh, when the island I was on, Micronesia. What they would do, they would take a lot of stones, get them super super duper hot dig a pit, put all the stoves there, and they actually have a lot of taro root, and they would mix that up to a bake, and they'd load um, banana leaves all over it, and then load pine cones over that. The banana leaves get super cool flavor. It's kind of a tangent, but we're talking about bacon. Hey, it's, it, it's all part of uh, using the stove and, uh, you know, different ways of uh, different cultures and different ideas on how to do things. I mean, this is great. Yeah, banana leaves are a big part of uh, cooking in Vietnam, too. So uh, when I go to the grocery store with my mom or something like that, we usually pick that stuff up because uh, there's no way to simulate that kind of flavor for authentic cooking. It's well, basically hey, like a vegan saran wrap. This stuff's pretty awesome. Hey, Johnny, we're coming up on the uh, hour mark. Uh, is there any final thoughts, any words that – you might want to add before we uh, sign off for the night. You know what? I had tons of things, but, I mean, it's been – I can't believe an hour's already gone by. That's pretty awesome. Um, basically, to reiterate, this stove is a stove that runs off your biofuels, uh, runs best off of woods, things that are dry, and if you want something that can cook cleanly in any circumstance, in any condition – this is the stove. It's all made, sourced in the United States of America, um, and uh, MSRP is at 139. Sweet. There you go, folks. And if you have any other questions, check out his website, check out his Facebook page, email him. Very approachable, I must say. When I when I talk to him on the phone, we talk for a long time. Very approachable and. Uh, 
I'm just glad that I had the opportunity to uh, test your gear. Um, and again, real quick, I wanted to thank you for uh, doing the review. That was awesome, and I appreciate it. And I'm really excited that you liked it. Oh, well, I, um, I'm honored from, like, both of you guys being able to test your gear. I mean, it's two great quality products that uh, I'm just glad that I had an opportunity to share with folks. And uh, hopefully they'll be able to go out and have some of the cool experiences that I've had and that I'm going to have with your products. I look forward to that. And I challenge folks, too, that if you get any of these products, either the T Tahoma Field Knife or the um, BioStove, take photos, post them on my Facebook page. Maybe we'll, if we get enough folks, maybe we'll run a contest of, like, you know, where's – where's the stove at or where's the knife at sort of contest and uh, I'll give away some prize or something. That's something that we can talk about down the road. But uh, I, I know that I want to thank you uh, for coming on with us uh, and hopefully maybe a couple months down the road we can get you back on here for an update, see where you're at, and, uh, you know, if we have more questions from folks, we'll, we'll do a round robin. Uh, chat and uh, we'll have a good time. I, I certainly had a good time tonight. Andy, you have any final thoughts before we roll out? No, just finally great to meet Johnny. I heard a lot of good things about you. Saw your product. It looks great when I watched Wingman's product and uh, maybe I have to uh, you know, bug you to help me out uh, getting a stove over on my channel. Yeah, well, again, your, your channel is pretty cool too and uh, maybe we can uh, work something out. Maybe a swap. Your knife looks pretty awesome as well. <laughs> Yeah, it might be a pretty good uh, trade over, so definitely. <laughs> there you go, the barter system at work, live right here on YouTube. You're seeing it. The prepared lifestyle happening live right here. Folks, thank you very much for joining us. I want to thank Johnny again, and I want to thank my co host, Andy. Um, we're going to try to do this show twice a month, so let us know in the comments what you want to see. Um, and if there's anybody that you want to see us interview, and we'll be back soon with another live show for you. This is Wingman signing out. Thanks again, folks, for tuning in. Take care. Until the next time.